Hello, friends, and thank you for taking time on this Thursday to get into the Word of God so that the Word of God can speak to us. Today we're looking at Acts chapter 2, and I'll tell you what, Acts 2 has so many dynamic elements to it, not, you know, not the least of which is the Holy Spirit showing up near the beginning of Acts 2. Then you have Peter, you know, what, just days, weeks from his failure, now stepping forward and proclaiming the gospel. You have all the nations gathered together for the celebration of Pentecost. They're there to hear the gospel. The Holy Spirit is moving on them. And in response to Peter's message of the gospel, they are saved. They respond obediently to his message. They say, what do we do? Peter says, repent and believe the good news. And they do that, and they're baptized. All those are dynamic elements. But for our purpose today, I want to focus on the last several verses of chapter 2 that speak to us about our Lord's church and the birth of his church. Starting in verse 41. So those who accepted Peter's message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 people were added to them. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. So let's just pause right there for a moment. What a dynamic outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the likes of which we would probably associate with like a Billy Graham crusade or something to that effect, Louis Palau of our modern day. You know, this experience happening within the context of our local churches would be unheard of to say the least. And yet there's elements here that I think we can latch on to in terms of a pattern of a life, if you will, within the church itself, we see there are several things that they made um, essential and I guess we could say a, a natural part of the life of the church. One was they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. The word of God, as brought through the teaching of the apostles, was the essential foundation on which everything else would be built, whether it was fellowship, whether it was breaking of bread, or it was prayer. All of it was found, you know, all of it was built upon the foundation of the teaching of the word. And it just goes to show that when the word of God is primary to what's happening in the church, then God will bless all the other components that we see here of the fellowship, the breaking of bread, and prayer. But it must be founded in the word of God. For after all, what do we know about fellowship in terms of how Christ would have his church fellowship outside the word of God? And what do we know about the breaking of bread except through the Word of God and prayer through the Word of God? And so we've got to make sure, friends, that as we're thinking about the life of the church, that the essential foundational bedrock of that is the teaching of the Word of God. And think about how many denominations today are dying. How many churches have died because they made the Word secondary at best and they even relegated it to more of man's opinion rather than presenting it as God's divinely revealed truth. And when that ceases to be the case, when we stop to believe the Bible to be inspired, inerrant, infallible, God's own breathed out words, then you can expect that church, that denomination, that religious, whatever it is, group, to die. Because God protects his word, God promotes his word, God empowers his word. And so one key essential component of the life of the church is the teaching of the word of God, the apostles' teaching. Secondary fellowship. And this fellowship is a oneness. It's a kindred spirit. It's a, it's a coming together of diverse backgrounds and diverse experiences blending into one corporate experience. You know, and it lends itself to the idea of sacrifice. Because if we keep reading, the Bible says, first of all, everybody was filled with awe and wonders. And many signs and wonders were taking place through the apostles. Now the believers were together and they held all things in common. Koinonia. Everything was one. Now, this, of course, isn't, isn't advocating communism. You know, we always think about communism and its negative political slant. Of course, there absolutely is a negative political slant there. But communism basically means everything's common. The experience is common. The property is common. Well, here is talking about the fact that although they still had this property, they had such a strong bond of unity and fellowship that that property was available for whatever need the church had or whatever need the community might have that was a means to presenting the gospel to others. What a powerful demonstration of what the church should look like in her fellowship and in her uh, com uh, connecting to the community and impacting the community. It says they sold their possessions and they distributed them to all who had need. They were devoting themselves to meeting together. And I love it. When you put all that together, the word of God was foundational. Fellowship was essential. Sacrifice was, was, was desired, not, not demanded, desired. 
breaking of bread, prayer, when those components are present in the church. Look at what it says in verse 46. And the Lord added to their number every day, those daily, those who were being saved. There was growth. There was kingdom growth. Not this swapping of sheep that we see take place so often where you have somebody who becomes disgruntled. They don't like the paint. They don't like the carpet. They don't like the music. Uh, give me a break, by the way. Grow up. Instead, they had people engaging unbelievers with the gospel, and by doing that, they were helping people come to a saving knowledge of Christ, and they were adding, legitimately adding. I don't know that, and, and this is a bit of an indicting statement against me because I'm your pastor, but I don't know that we've seen a tremendous outflowing of legitimate kingdom growth in, in, in many seasons, both in local churches and in the church universal. You know, and we see all these new church models pop up, and they claim growth, but frankly, all they've done is, is stolen sheep. They've just lured people away with a, a more dynamic worship or a, a more me-centered worship or a, a word that's not quite as confronting and, and, and in your face and a little bit deviating away a little bit from the Word of God. And, and that doesn't bring kingdom growth at all. This is kingdom growth. And this is the model that, that God initiated in his church and for his church. And so, friends, we've got to stay committed. We've got to stay committed to making the teaching of the Word of God central and essential to everything we do. As long as I'm your pastor, that'll be true. Secondly, we've got to make fellowship organic. We have to make certain that we are constantly connecting to one another, whether it's that initial greeting in the worship center or whether it's that time of fellowship in our small groups or whether it's a special event we're having. Fellowship's got to be essential as well, that organic coming together and then enjoying life together, whether it's the breaking of bread. And then, of course, struggling together through prayer, engaging God in prayer, crying out to him for his will to be done on earth just like it is in heaven. And what will happen is when that is in place, the community will be impacted. Lives will be changed and the kingdom will grow. Well, I pray you've had a dynamic week where the word of God has been rich in your life, where, where personal worship has been so uh, invigorating that you couldn't wait to get to work. You couldn't wait to get to school or to recreation and share what God was doing. And I pray that that will continue for you today and tomorrow. And as we look forward with great anticipation, for what God's going to do in the corporate worship event on Sunday, make it a priority. Make the commitment now that nothing's going to get in your way. And you will be together with the people of God for the purpose of fellowship and celebrating who Jesus is, what he's done, and now what he's commissioned us to do with the good news of that gospel, which is to live sent.